Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, part of the Agilent Cell Analysis Global Conference. My name is Bear from Biotech, a part of Agilent, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Now let's get started. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you would like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and click Send. We will answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, you may also click the Ask a Question box to submit your concerns. After the completion of the Q&A portion of this presentation, our speaker will be available for more questions in the networking area of the virtual conference from 2 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'd now like to present today's speaker, Emily Dunkelberger, staff scientist in the Laboratory of Chemical Physics at the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases, which is part of the United States National Institutes of Health. For a complete biography on Dr. Dunkelberger, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Emily, you may now begin your presentation. Thanks, Bear. Um, thank you for thank you to Biotech for the invitation to be here today, and thank you to Agilent for putting on this event. Today, I want to tell you about how we in the Eaton Group at NIH are using physical chemistry and a high throughput drug screen to find a drug to treat sickle cell disease. Before I talk about our drug screen, though, I want to provide some background about sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia is uh, known as the first molecular disease. And that is because in the 1940s, Linus Pauling discovered that it was a single point mutation on the beta globin gene that causes the disease. Um, in normal hemoglobin or hemoglobin A, there's a glutamic acid on the, on the beta strands. However, in sickle hemoglobin or hemoglobin S, that glutamic acid is mutated to valine. This mutation um, occurs in about 1 in 12 African Americans. Uh, sickle hemoglobin upon um, oxygen delivery to the tissues, form, uh, sickle hemoglobin aggregates in, into long fibers within red blood cells. Uh, those red blood cells sickle, they go from a biconcave disc shape to a sickled shape, and the resulting cells are um, less flexible, more rigid, and cause vasoocclusion. Vasoocclusion um, causes recurrent pain, anemia, organ damage, and early mortality. Some groups at NIH are working towards curing the disease through stem cell transplantation and gene therapy. In our group, we are looking to find a new drug to treat the disease. Currently, there's one drug on the market called hydroxyurea that works in about 50% of people with the disease. And in the absence of a cure or a drug to treat the disease, people with sickle cell disease are left to get uh, blood transfusions during uh, painful sickle crises and are also given painkillers to just treat the pain. Um, neither of these are great options. And so we are looking for a new drug to treat the disease. Sickle cell disease is a worldwide problem. In the United States, fewer than 100,000 people have the disease, so it's considered an orphan disease. Um, but there are more than 3 million people worldwide, primarily in Africa and India, who have sickle cell disease. In addition to that, between 50 and 90 percent of Africans who are born with sickle cell disease die before the age of five. So this is truly, um, it's, it's a problem in the United States, and it's definitely a problem um, elsewhere. I want to give just a, a very brief timeline of the disease. Like I mentioned, in the 1940s, Linus Pauling discovers that uh, it's the mutant hemoglobin that causes sickle cell disease. In the 1980s, biophysical studies showed four different ways to treat the disease with drugs. But then it wasn't until 1998 where one FDA-approved drug came to market to treat the disease, and that would be hydroxyurea. I mentioned um, groups that are curing the disease by stem cell transplants. There is a group um, led by John Tisdale in the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute here at NIH that um, has developed a way to cure the disease. And he, he estimates that about 10% of patients could be cured by stem cell transplants. However, um, 
stem cell transplants can really only be performed at advanced medical facilities, and it's not really a feasible option for curing people worldwide. Instead, other drugs in addition to hydroxyurea are needed that can be used by the millions of people in developing countries that don't have access to advanced medical facilities. I mentioned that sickle cell disease is caused by a molecular mutation. This is a cartoon of a hemoglobin tetramer where there's two alpha subunits shown in green and two beta subunits shown in blue. The yellow dot on the beta subunits shows the location of the um, negative glutamate in normal hemoglobin to neutral valine in hemoglobin S mutation. So the mutation occurs on the surface of the two beta subunits. This produces a hydrophobic, a sticky hydrophobic patch on the molecular surface, which is what allows um, sickle hemoglobin to aggregate. Normal red blood cells look like biconcave discs. Um, the way I describe biconcave discs to my family is that they look like little donuts. It turns out that oxygenated sickle cells also are biconcave discs. However, upon deoxygenation, sickle cells take on a variety of different morphologies. Some of them look like Pac-Man structures shown at the top of this slide. Some of them look more like amoeba structures in the bottom left of this figure. Um, other other morphologies shown in the in the middle of this figure um, look more like the sickle shape that you might expect. Um, most of these sickled cells also have long spindly bits um, called spicules, and that is indicative of um, hemoglobin aggregating into fibers within these cells. Upon reoxygenation, sickle cells do return to being biconcave discs. Um, however, after approximately 40 to 50 oxy reoxy cycles in a sickle cell, um, they become irreversibly sickled. Now I want to talk about sickle cell disease pathophysiology. Um, in this top figure, I'm showing a normal red blood cell pass through the arteries into the capillaries. Um, it's in the capillaries that oxygen is released to tissues. And in a normal red blood cell, it remains a biconcave disc and is very malleable. So it can squeeze through the mic microcirculation before it continues to travel throughout the body. However, a sickle red blood cell upon deoxygenation in the capillary um, changes morphology. It becomes sticky on the surface and much more rigid and thus a log jam can be produced in the microcirculation, preventing cells from continuing to move through the body. Blockage of the microcirculation deprives tissues of oxygen and it can occur throughout the body. Consequences include severe pain um, to the point where it can be called a sickle crisis. Um, it can cause irreversible organ damage and, and a shortened lifespan. Now I'd like to talk about the kinetics of hemoglobin aggregation and the kinetics of fiber formation. What I'm showing is a plot of the fraction sickled as a function of time. And at the origin, I should have pointed out that this is the time after deoxygenation. What has been found through um, many different studies, NMR studies, microscopy studies, is that there is a characteristic delay time after deoxygenation in which no cells sickle. After this delay time, the fraction sickle increases, shown in this red curve, as a function of time. What our group found on the order of 40 years ago or so is that there is an enormous sensitivity of these kinetics on the initial sickle sickle hemoglobin concentration, such that this delay time is proportional to one over the concentration of hemoglobin S raised to the 30th power. This means that even just an 8% decrease in the concentration of hemoglobin S increases the delay time tenfold. That's huge and um, not seen in many other um, proteins. Now I want to relate these kinetics to the pathophysiology. It turns out that it is actually this delay time that allows the vast majority of cells to pass through the capillary before fiber formation. So if this is a sickle red blood cell, it becomes deoxygenated in the capillary, and it's this delay time that allows the cell to continue passing through and not actually get stuck. 
Um, it is it's really the minority of cells that sickle during transit and may obstruct the microcirculation shown in this bottom cartoon. At equilibrium, all cells sickle at oxygen tissue pressures. Therefore, it's this delay time that makes the disease survivable. Disease severity is therefore determined by the relationship be between the delay time and the capillary transit time. I wanna take this idea of kinetics and pathophysiology and relate it to um, a drug treatment. In a minute, I'll talk about um, ways to treat sickle cell disease with a drug, all of which inhibit fiber formation by one of five mechanisms. The idea would be to um, administer a drug that extends the delay time such that the cell doesn't sickle in the microcirculation as shown in the top cartoon, but instead um, sickles elsewhere. So even partial inhibition will be therapeutic because it will increase the delay time allowing more cells to escape the smallest vessels of tissues before fibers form to sickle cells and cause vasoocclusion. Now I'd like to talk about five different mechanisms for inhibiting fiber formation. There are five therapeutic approaches to treat the disease, all by inhibiting hemoglobin polymerization, the cause of disease pathology. I will briefly mention each of the five on this slide and then go into them in more detail later. The first is to induce fetal hemoglobin or hemoglobin F synthesis to decrease sickle hemoglobin concentration. And this is how hydroxyurea, the one drug on the market works. The second mechanism is to increase cell volume to decrease hemoglobin S concentration. We've shown this in our group. Uh, a few years ago, we published a paper that showed um, small molecules and ionophores that, that work in this way. The third mechanism is to destabilize the fiber by blocking intramolecular contacts in the fiber. The fourth mechanism is to bind the, find a drug that binds to the R conformation of hemoglobin to de decrease the concentration of fiber forming T conformation. And that is how Voxelator works. That's a drug, um, it's, it may have come to market at this point. And the fifth mechanism is to decrease intracellular 2,3-DPG to decrease the concentration of the T conformation of hemoglobin. And that is how the drug Midipivit works, and that is currently being tested at NIH in clinical trials. So now I'll go through each mechanism in a bit more detail. The first is to stimulate hemoglobin F formation. Like I said, hydroxyurea works this way. It's been used to increase the fraction of hemoglobin F in, um, in red blood cells. The difference between hemoglobin S and hemoglobin F is not in the alpha subunit shown in blue, but rather in the beta subunit. So hemoglobin S has two beta subunits, whereas hemoglobin F has two gamma subunits. When you have both types of hemoglobin, you're also uh, bound to get some amount of SF hybrid. It turns out that hemoglobin molecules with the gamma subunit rarely enter into hemoglobin fibers. So by increasing the amount of hemoglobin F in red blood cells, it's, um, effectively, it effectively dilutes the amount of hemoglobin S, and so there's less hemoglobin that can enter into fibers. So um, this dilution of hemoglobin S increases the delay time up to a thousandfold in people who take hydroxyurea. The second mechanism is to swell red blood cells to decrease hemoglobin S concentration. Um, swelling red blood cells increases the cell volume and dilutes sickle hemoglobin. So again, um, increasing an 8% increase in volume produces a tenfold increase in delay time, which um, which is a, a huge increase. Uh, we identified several candidates in our group, such as menensin, which is a small molecule, and gramicidin, which is an ionophore. But unfortunately, none of the molecules and peptides we tested are FDA approved at this point. The third mechanism is to inhibit um, hemoglobin fiber formation by blocking intramolecular contacts in hemoglobin with a small molecule. So you could imagine that since you could imagine um, developing a small molecule that 
uh, attaches to the surface of hemoglobin and blocks intermolecular contacts, um, preventing aggregation. However, there's a prohibitively large amount of hemoglobin in the body, and currently there are no drugs in clinical trials that are thought to work in this way. The fourth mechanism is to find a molecule that binds to the R state of, of hemoglobin to decrease the T state concentration. Uh, before I talk too much about that, I want to first describe what I mean by R state and T state. Oxyhemoglobin is uh, considered the R state of hemoglobin. Upon deoxygenation, the alpha and beta subunits rotate 15 degrees past each other um, to become the deoxy state. And this new conformation of hemoglobin is considered the T state. So oxy goes with R state and deoxy goes with T state. It turns out that um, many studies have shown that it's only the deoxy or T state that fits into the fiber structure shown. Cartoon around fibers will be primarily composed of T state hemoglobin. So the idea is to find a drug that shifts the equilibrium from the T state to the R state. Uh, down below, I'm showing um, oxygen binding curves uh, in the absence and presence of um, such a drug. The blue curve shows a binding curve for um, red blood cells in the absence of the drug. In the presence of a drug that worked in this way, the the curve shifts to the left, um, showing that oxygen is held tighter in the presence of this drug, meaning there's more R state hemoglobin around. A reminder, this is how um, voxelator works. The fifth mechanism is to decrease intracellular 2,3-diphosphoglycerate. 2,3-DPG is a small molecule found in, in blood, and uh, it binds to the T state of hemoglobin. So if you can decrease the amount of 2,3-DPG, um, it would decrease the concentration of the T state, shifting the equilibrium to the R state. And again, the oxygen binding curve um, would look similar to that in the, um, in the previous mechanism. Our extensive research has enabled us to develop a cellular assay for a relatively high throughput drug screen to discover anticycline drugs by, that act by four of these five mechanisms, basically all except for fetal hemoglobin induction. So now I want to talk about our assay in more detail. We perform our assay on a biotech Lionheart automated microscope where we collect bright field images of red blood cells. Currently, we have four biotech lion hearts in our group. This is a photograph of the lion. These are all photographs of the lion hearts of one of the lion hearts in our lab. You can see that the microscope doesn't take up too much bench, bench space, and there's the computer that controls the instrument. Below that, um, I'm showing a picture kind of like under the hood of the microscope. We, um, we did make one change to the instrument. We added a 430 nanometer bandpass filter to the light path to give us higher contrast deoxy images. In our experiments, in our assay, we start out with oxygenated red blood cells and we deoxygenate them. It turns out that oxy red blood cells absorb around 420 nanometers, whereas deoxy red blood cells absorb around 430 nanometers. And so by um, adding this bandpass filter, we get higher contrast deoxy images. Um, we, um, in order to deoxygenate red blood cells, we flood the instrument with nitrogen, and we can achieve less than 0.3% oxygen in less than 15 minutes when we, when we turn on the nitrogen source. Um, truly, we can get down to about 0.1% oxygen in about 10 minutes, which is really pushing the limits of this instrument. It wasn't meant to do that, but it can, and that's um, awesome for our assay. Um, and lastly, I'm showing a picture of um, our well plates. We do our experiments on a 384 well plate. Uh, we have temperature and humidity control in our instrument. We do all of our experiments at 37 degrees Celsius. And this is the little um, humidity chamber that houses 
our well plates, there's, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a trough that goes most of the way around the well plate that holds water for humidity. And we also use a custom well plate lid to better control the atmosphere in each well. So prior to doing our experiments, we send our well plates out to our collaborators and they pre-spot um, pre the well plates with the compounds we're planning to test. They send them back to us and then um, we get blood from our donors. At NIH, we are fortunate enough to have a steady group of people with sickle trait disease who are willing to come in week in and week out and donate, um, give their blood um, to be part of our, our protocol. So we get whole blood from our subjects and we then um, load columns one, two, 23, and 24 with our positive control blood suspension. Then we load columns three and 22 with our negative control blood suspension. The remaining wells on the plate are pre-spotted with the test compounds and we load those wells with the negative control blood suspension. Then we place our well plate in the instrument. We incubate for two hours at 37 degrees Celsius in humidified air, and we collect images of all wells every 30 minutes. So we get four images during our two hour incubation period. Then we perform a recharge step. All that means is that we turn on the nitrogen gas and um, fans start to run that circulate the nitrogen very quickly throughout the entire microscope and we run that step for 15 minutes to um, hopefully push all the oxygen out and really flood, flood the instrument um, with, um, with nitrogen. And after that, we, we leave the nitrogen on, but we begin to run our kinetic sequence. We run a kinetic sequence for 12 hours, again at 37 degrees Celsius, and at this point we're at about 0.1% oxygen. And we collect images of every well continuously for those 12 hours. We start at A1 and go all the way to P24 and cycle back again. So we're able to collect one image of every well on a 384 well plate in about 15 or 16 minutes. And then we cycle back to the, the top of the plate. Um, what we end up with is about, about 50 images. I think it's, it's 49 images to be exact um, of every single well. So we can take those 49 images and make a movie to illustrate um, how cells sickle. So um, before we start the video, I wanna describe what you're going to see. Um, this is a 12 hour experiment condensed into about 25 seconds. Um, at frame one, you'll see that uh, most of these red blood cells are laying flat on the bottom of the well plate. They all look like biconcave discs or donuts with a pretty transparent center and um, a dark outer ring. You might notice that some of the cells do look like ovals. Um, those are cells that for whatever reason um, aren't laying flat on the well plate. They are not sickled, but they are, they're laying on their side on the well plate. Once the video starts, you'll pretty quickly see that the cells um, get darker. When they get darker, that is indicative of um, the start of deoxygenation. And then you will see cells um, throughout the field sickle, such that by the end of the movie, approximately 90% of the cells in this field will be sickled. So at this point, we can go ahead and start the video, please. Um, so you notice that by the end of the video, most of uh, the red blood cells had sickled. Some of them may have looked like Pac-Man figures. Some of them, most of them had um, spicules and were um, in a sickled shape. The goal of our assay is to be able to plot fraction sickled versus time 
um, plots for each well. And to do that, we had to somehow quantify um, quantify sickling. Um, 15 years ago or so, we um, identified three different metrics that we could measure in our images to identify when a cell sickles. The first is the cell area. The cell area decreases when cells sickle. The second is eccentricity. Eccentricity increases when cells sickle. And the optical density ratio of the inner part of the cell to the outer part of the cell decreases when cells sickle. In this figure, I'm showing pairs of images of a single cell. The image on the left is a biconcave, is, is the cell when it's a biconcave disc, and the image on the right is the same cell um, after sickling. So um, you can see each pair of cells, pair of images for a given cell. And below each pair of images um, is a kinetics plot showing in blue the cell area as a function of time, in green is the eccentricity as a function of time, and in red is the density ratio as a function of time. It's the time at which these three metrics change in the direction that they're supposed to that we call the sickling time for a given cell. So we can count up the number of cells that, that, that are sickled at a given time and plot the fraction sickled versus time. About five years ago, we started to use machine learning to analyze our images. Um, we are doing experiments on 384 well, pl well plates and we're collecting about 50 images per well. What that means is that we end up with almost 20,000 images for a single well plate. That's a lot of images. And so we needed to come up with a really smart way and really fast way of, of classifying cells. So to do that, um, we turned to machine learning. What I'm showing in this figure are just screenshots of a training session I did where I looked at images from a given experiment and identified by eye cells that were sickled shown in red versus cells that were biconcave shown in blue. Um, the machine learning algorithm then takes my assignments and calculates 12 different metrics, including area, density, eccentricity, but also others, to determine the characteristics of each of those two classes of cells. Then we make a model based on those metrics, and we use that model to analyze data sets to individually determine how many cells are sickled in a given image at a given time point. And this is what the controls look like for our, for our uh, drug screen. Just a reminder, we're starting with oxyhemoglobin. Upon deoxygenation, it becomes deoxyhemoglobin. <clears throat> this is a picture of our 384 well plate. These are images from negative control at time zero versus um, the end of our experiment when greater than 90% of cells have sickled. And then this is a fraction sickled versus time plot. The negative control is shown in blue and the positive control shown in purple. The negative control um, is an average of 28 wells in columns three and 22 shown with the standard deviation error bars the positive control uh, um, also has contribution from 28 wells and the error bars are there, they're just quite small. The goal of our um, drug screen is to find candidate drugs that decrease, that increase the delay time or decrease the, the fraction sickled. And we want to find a candidate drug that um, has a fraction sickled um, below the, that maintains a fraction cycle below this therapeutic threshold. This therapeutic threshold is about 70% relative to the negative control. And that is something we calculated in our group a while ago. I'll explain where we get that in a minute or on the next slide. This is a plot of fraction cycle versus time um, for three th three theoretical calculations that we did. The first shown in blue, um, the blue continuous curve is the theoretically calculated kinetics curve with a standard deviation shown in the blue dashed lines. Um, this curve is for sickle trait blood that is about 65% hemoglobin A and 35% hemoglobin S. 
this is um, this is um, basically equivalent to our negative controls in our assay. There's a less severe form of sickle cell disease called SC disease, where red blood cells are made of made up of about 50% hemoglobin S and 50% hemoglobin C. Um, for for us to think about it, we we know that hemoglobin C is similar to hemoglobin A in that it doesn't enter fibers. So to get this green calculated curve, we substituted 50% of the hemoglobin in the trait distribution to with hemoglobin A. And that theoretically calculated kinetics curve is shown in green with um, error bars um, shown in the dashed curves. There is another form of sickle cell disease that is considered benign. Oh, I should I should mention that if we were to find a drug that has um, kinetics similar to the green curve, we could potent, we could call it a potentially therapeutic um, compound because we know SC disease is uh, much less severe than sickle cell disease. The third um, the third curve is representative of um, benign, this benign disease called sickle cell disease with hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin. Um, uh, and hemoglobin is the, the form of, he of hemoglobin found in fetuses, and it persists through about one year of age. After that, normal hemoglobin is produced. But um, in, in the case where fetal hemoglobin persists into adulthood, those with this uh, form of the disease um, rarely suffer any of the health consequences that those people with sickle cell disease have. So in this calculation, we replaced 30% of the hemoglobin in the, in the trait distribution with hemoglobin F, and the result is this red kinetics curve. So if we were to find a drug that is similar to um, this red curve and a compound that has kinetics similar to this red curve, it would be a potentially curative um, compound. So a couple years ago, we were provided with a collection of 12,657 compounds that had been previously tested in humans. Our research goal is to discover a new use for an old compound because any drug that shows therapeutically significant anticycline activity in our screen at concentrations that are known to be non-toxic in humans can be tested by others in research clinical trials at NIH on sickle cell subjects. In this figure, I'm showing um, a, a map of the well plates that we received. The red wells are the edge wells. We omitted those results from our data to um, avoid any edge effects. The positive and negative controls are shown in orange and gold on both sides of the plate. And then the green wells are the wells that were pre-spotted with test compounds. We performed our initial screen at 10 micromolar in triplicate. And within each triplicate, we used blood from three different donors. I wanna go back real quick to talk about um, the controls in our experiment. The negative controls, um, were done in physio, the negative controls are made of, up of blood suspension and physiological buffer, pH 7.4, 300 milliosmoles. And at the end of the experiment, most of the cells are sickled. There are very few biconcave discs. Um, our positive control is um, a blood cell suspension in low osmolarity buffer. In this case, the pH is still 7.4, but um, the buffer is at about 180 milliosmoles. So going to a low osmolarity buffer swells and spheres cells. You can tell that the cells in this image um, are darker, um, have darker centers than biconcave discs. There are very few biconcave discs um, in this image, and that's indicative of an increased cell volume. So. That's, uh, we've found that going to a low osmolarity buffer for a positive control is a very robust and reliable um, positive control in our assay. So the first thing we do after analyzing our data with machine learning is we create what we call dot plots. 
Dot plots are a map of our 384 well plates where each well is color coded based on the fraction sickled relative to the average negative control for the well plate. As a result, the positive controls end up being shaded in purple because they have very low fraction sickled relative to, to the negative control. The negative controls are shaded in black, and then all of the compound wells are shaded according to um, according to this legend. And the, um, we create dot plots for every frame in our experiment. I've just grabbed one. This is frame 20 from a given experiment. And you can see that at frame 20, most of the wells have pretty high fraction sickled relative to the control, but there are three wells that stand out. And I want to um, look at, now go to, go to the kinetics for one of these wells. So I, I chose 018 to look at the kinetics for. On this plot, I'm um, showing the fraction sickled versus time for a given well. On this plot, I have, um, I've plotted the average negative controls for the three plates in the triplicate, the green plate, the blue plate, and the red plate. I've also plotted the average positive controls um, in these dashed curves in, the, in green, blue, and red, and then plotted the single well kinetics for 018 um, for the three, um, three wells in the triplicate. And you can see that the kinetics for 018 are very different from that of the negative control. So we generated dot plots and we generated kinetics for kinetics plots for all 12,000 some odd compounds in our initial screen. And we um, categorized our results um, by identifying three different three different groups of inhibitors. The first is the complete inhibitors, the second is the partial inhibitors, and the third are the lysis inhibitors. The complete inhibitors are those that um, prevent sickling for the duration of the experiment. Um, so you can see those kinetics um, represented by this well B7. The negative controls are highly sickled by the end of the experiment, but the single well kinetics look pretty much like the positive controls. And it's important to always go back and look at the actual images and not just the kinetics to make sure that the kinetics are really representing what's going on. And in doing that, we can see that most of the cells are biconcave disks at the beginning of the experiment and still biconcave disks at the end. The group of partial inhibitors, um, a, a, rep a representative well of, from the partial inhibitor class is shown here in H21. Um, you can see that there is some sickling in the single well kinetics relative to the negative control kinetics, and that um, is apparent in the images as well. So um, this is an image from H21 at the beginning of the experiment where cells are biconcave disks. And at the end, there's approximately 30 to 40% of cells that are sickled. So this is a partial inhibitor. It's, uh, we still consider it a hit. And the third class are, is the lysis inhibitors. Um, if we had only looked at the kinetics, we might say, oh, this, is, this compound um, in well G4 is, is a partial inhibitor, maybe even a complete inhibitor. Um, but after looking at the images, it's clear that something else is happening besides um, besides just um, in uh, complete or partial inhibition. At time zero, we can see that there are very few biconcave disks in the image, meaning that this compound, whatever it is, has swelled and even sphered the red blood cells even at early times. At late times, you can see again that there's no cells, um, no sickled cells in the final, or maybe very few sickled cells in the final image. So um, we found a, um, we found a, a, lot, a large amount of compounds that seem to inhibit sickling by lysis, or at least by swelling and sphering cells. We do understand that it's important not to give um, a drug to someone with anemia that 
a drug that causes um, hemolysis to someone with anemia, but we do want to further pursue these compounds at lower concentrations to see if they have um, an inhibitory but not um, lysis effect on red blood cells. So after looking at the dot plots and the kinetics and the images, we actually wanted, wanted to find um, or we wanted to use a mathematical way to identify um, or to define a hit. And uh, we did that using SVD or singular value decomposition. From our SVD analysis, we ended up finding 335 hits from our initial screen. And we defined a hit as having um, a delta over sigma value of greater than three on at least two of the three plates that we tested in the triplicate. SVD is a powerful mathematical method for averaging data and eliminating noise. Um, singular value decomposition represents a set of data, so in this case, a 380, 384 sickling curves, as the product of three matrices, the U matrix, the S matrix, and the V matrix. So the data, including the noise, is exactly reproduced by the matrix product U by S by V. Um, so um, as, as judged by the magnitude of the singular values, the complete set of 384 sickling curves for a single plate can be quite well represented by the single average sickling curve U1 with an amplitude V1 for the curve from each well. So what I'm showing here are, are three more um, compounds from our initial screen. Um, the first two we consider partial inhibitors and therefore potentially therapeutic, and the third is a complete inhibitor, which is potentially curative. But in the top panel, I'm showing the raw data where the continuous curves are the single well kinetics and um, the positive and negative controls are also um, on the curves and dash lines with their error bars. And the bottom panel is the U1 by S1 by V1 um, SVD curves. And you can see that the SVD analysis um, truly represents the raw data, but it's, it's a bit cleaner and the noise has been eliminated. Um, the value of V1 for a well containing a candidate drug is compared to the to the average V1 values of the negative control wells. And if the V1 for the compound is uh, lower than the average V1 for the negative control by more than three standard deviations, we consider it a hit. Oops. So what we found in our initial screen is 267 compounds that showed therapeutically significant anticycline activity and 62 compounds that caused hemolysis. In total, our research discovered 335 compounds to test in a dose response screen. So that was the next step. Um, this figure is a map of what our well plates look like for the dose response screen. Again, the edge wells are shaded in red. We omit that data. We have our positive and negative controls on both sides of the plate. And then our dose response screen was performed at nine concentrations shown by the gold to green gradient um, for every compound. So we tested um, we tested all 335 compounds from 10 micromolar down to one nanomolar in triplicate and again performed the drug screen, um, used, um, used three different donors' blood within a, within a triplicate. These are some of the uh, raw data from our dose response screen. Um, these are sickling, for each of these three compounds, I'm showing sickling kinetics at 10 micromolar. The continuous curves, again, are the single well kinetics, and the dashed curves with error bars are the positive and negative controls. We got sickling kinetics for, obviously, for all nine concentrations for every compound, and to... Um, better compare what was happening at each concentration, we plotted the V1 of the compound relative to the V1 of the control as a function of concentration shown here in the bottom panels. So if the ratio of the fraction sickled of the compound is small compared to the control, then um, we consider 
um, we consider the compound to have some, to be showing some inhibition at a given concentration. So for this first compound, you can see that the ratio, at least on the green plate and the red plate, are very small, around 0.5. Um, and this ratio approaches one at lower concentrations. For the second compound, it looks like all three plates in the triplicate have a ratio close to zero. At 10 micromolar, um, the ratio is small, also at three micromolar, and then approaches one at higher concentrations. For this last compound, um, it's a little bit unclear what's happening at higher concentrations, but there does seem to be a trend um, in the fraction sickled of the compound relative to the control, um, such as it approaches one at lower, even lower concentrations. So um, we used SVD on all of these data and were able to get these plots. We ended up fitting those, those data and calculating an AC50 for each compound. This particular compound we found to be an inhibitor at, at about 10 micromolar. This particular compound shows inhibition down to three micromolar. And after looking really hard at the images um, from this compound, we've, we found that there was uh, hemolysis at higher concentrations. But at lower concentrations, we found that this compound sphered, swelled and sphered cells and, in, and inhibited sickling, but didn't actually lyse the cells. So we consider this compound a lysis hit, but also it's an inhibitor down to about 30 micromolar. Our dose response screen of 335 compounds at nine concentrations resulted in 138 hits at concentrations of 10 micromolar or less. 96 compounds showed therapeutically significant anti-sickling activity, 42 compounds caused hemolysis, and so in total, 138 compounds were considered hits and de-anonymized for future testing. This de-anonymization happened um, this spring, and so um, it has opened up a, a lot of reading and more experiments for us to do. With that, I would like to conclude and briefly mention some of the future directions that we're taking. Um, sickle cell disease has been extensively studied since the 1940s, and it's considered the first molecular disease. Unfortunately, though, there's only one single partially successful drug that can be taken to treat the disease. Our research uses the Biotech Lionheart automated microscope, um, and it, the microscope allows us to screen thousands of compounds in a given week. Our assay identifies um, compounds that inhibit polymerization and sickling, which is the cause of the disease pathology. Recent de-anonymization has allowed us to further test hit compounds in a whole blood assay, which is an ongoing project in our group. It, um, we just started this a couple months ago, not very long ago. And our assay um, is also being used currently on mice with sickle trait and sickle cell disease, as well as in a midipivot research clinical trial at NIH. So all this is to say we have a lot of ongoing experiments. With that, I would like to um, thank my advisor at NIH, Bill Eaton, and my colleagues, Belhu, Troy, Quan, and Eric, we each bring something unique to the table. Some of us are physicists who do um, computer simulations and theoretical calculations, and some of us are experimentalists in the lab. So I would also, um, so we, we work together to, um, to get this, we, we had to work together to get this drug screen off the ground. Um, I'd also like to thank, a couple people at Biotech, Diane and Mega, who um, have been in, invaluable resources for me. Um, they've they helped a ton in getting um, the Lionheart just the way we need it to be to best work for our assay. Um, so with that, I will be happy to take questions. All right. Well, thank you, Emily, for that informative presentation.
Uh, we'll now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. I just want to remind people that if you have, have a question that you haven't asked, you can do so right now if you click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. Uh, looks like we have a couple, so let's get started. Uh, our first question is, why did you use sickle trach blood for this drug screen? Yeah, so um, I, I think I briefly mentioned that we use sickle trait blood in our drug screen rather than sickle blood from sickle cell, rather than blood from donors who have full sickle cell disease. And the reason for this is because um, we don't want someone with anemia to come in week in and week out to be giving blood for our assay. This is this is a project that has been ongoing for um, I think at least a decade now. And so at NIH, um, it's it's been really helpful to um, have a steady stream of donors here at NIH who are willing to come once a week, every week for years at a time to give blood. So we wouldn't want to ask someone with sickle cell disease to do that. Um, people with sickle trait um, don't really suffer any of the negative health consequences of those with sickle cell disease. Um, in addition to that, sickle trait blood is a, is a little bit less finicky to use in an assay. So that's why we are using sickle trait blood at this point. Um, let's see, our next question is, do you expect any differences in the assay or results when switching from using sickle trait blood to sickle cell blood? Um, uh, the answer is yes. So one of the goals of our um, in the near future is to actually move from using dilute sickle trait blood to whole blood and then moving from whole blood from sickle trait donors to whole blood from sickle cell donors. And we do expect some differences. The primary difference is that we expect um, blood from sickle cell donors to sickle much faster. In our assay, um, there is a lag in sickling. That delay time is on the order of 100 to 200 minutes or so. We expect sickle cell blood to sickle much faster just because um, all of the hemoglobin in sickle cell blood is hemoglobin S, whereas in sickle trait blood, the proportion of hemoglobin is about 65% hemoglobin A, which doesn't sickle, and 35% hemoglobin S, which does sickle. We've got another one here. Um, do any compounds you tested do anything to change the cellular morphology outside of what you're used to seeing when cells sickle? And how does your machine learning algorithm account for those changes? Um, yeah, so some of the compounds we tested do change the cellular morphology outside of um, just forming biconcave disc or sickled cells. So I kind of alluded to that in my example of the lysis inhibitors. Uh, we did notice that that particular compound caused cells to sphere um, immediately after loading the plate with red blood cells. We also noticed that some compounds cause some compounds caused um, crenation in our red blood cells. So um, crenated red blood cells are are biconcave discs in that they have a somewhat transparent center, but then they also have kind of a bumpy surface to them. It's very easy to see in our in our images when that happens. And um, so yeah, so we had to really watch out for that. We even though we use machine learning to analyze all of our images, we actually do go back and look at just about every every single well in every single plate. And so um, we've looked at a lot of images trying to make sure that the machine learning algorithm really and the resulting kinetics curves really represents what's happening. So our machine learning algorithm is always a work in progress. We are constantly trying to make it better and make it um, such that it better defines um, the cell shapes that we're seeing. And we currently don't have a great um, way to identify created cells, but it's something that we're constantly working on. Let's see, we have another one here. Uh, you mentioned using this assay to test mouse blood. Can you talk a little bit more about those experiments? 
Yeah, so one project that I was involved in last year was um, a project where mice were fed either a, um, a normal diet or an extremely low iron diet. And it's thought that um, in the presence of a low, uh, it's thought that mice on a low iron diet will be less prone to sickle cell disease. So uh, my collaborators were in charge of the mice and feeding the mice and treating the mice. And um, then they gave us, these, these mice were bred to have um, human hemoglobin S in all of their red blood cells. And so um, they were um, transgenic mice with human hemoglobin fed either an iron rich or an iron depleted diet. We received the blood in our experiment, uh, in our lab. And then we did this same assay where we um, loaded the well plate with this mouse blood and um, measured the sickling kinetics and found slight differences um, in the sickling times for mice on the iron rich diet versus mice on the iron depleted diet. All right, well, it looks like we have time for one more question. Um, what are some of the metrics other than cell area, eccentricity, and density ratio that you're able to measure using your machine learning assay platform? Yeah, um, to be honest, um, I could not list all 12 of the metrics that we're currently using, but I know that um, one of the metrics that is currently used is um, the perimeter of the cell. So um, the the machine learning algorithm is, um, is set up to measure the number of pixels along the edge of the cell. And um, there's a range in which there's a, um, a range in pixel number that we think a normal cell, a normal biconcave disc cell has versus that of a sickled cell versus that of a crenated cell. So you could imagine if you have a circular a circular cell, a biconcave disc, it has X number of pixels on the edge um, that forms the perimeter. But a cell that is crenated and has lots of little bumps on the edge would actually have a larger perimeter, a larger number of pixels making up the perimeter of the cell, um, such that that would be a useful metric for identifying if a cell is larger than a normal biconcave disc. So um, I know the perimeter is one of them. Um, I would have to probably look up what some of the others are. So I hope that, Great. that helped a little bit. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for your time today and your important research. Uh, before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us. And any questions submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker uh, via the contact information that you provided at the time of your registration. If you have any other questions for Emily today, please join her in the networking area of the virtual conference uh, starting in a couple minutes and going um, until, let's see, 2.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. If you have any biotech-specific product questions, please visit us at the biotech booth found in the exhibit hall. This webcast can also be viewed on demand through July of 2021. So until next time, thank you and goodbye.